the previous three days of the meeting. They're packed with talks and interesting discussions. And uh, today we're turning to a thorny topic of implementation. How do we actually put the knowledge that we have into practice? And so in a moment, I will uh, turn this over to my co-chair, Jill Preminger, um, who will introduce our keynote speaker and the panel that will follow up. And so after the first panel, we'll have a break, just like in previous days. And the second part of today will be another panel on hot topics and future directions so we can chart the course for teleideology and consider ways we can do things better. So just a couple of reminders, just like in previous days, use the chat uh, in WebEx to pose your questions for the keynote and for the panelists. Um, and I think this is it. And yes, use the layout button uh, to get your best view, either the focus, the stack view, or the grid, and you can see everybody. Okay, so without further ado, um, Jill. Good evening. Um, so uh, the, the, at the past uh, few internet and audiology meetings, we were talking about it, the difficulties of implementation so that's why we decided that that would need that would be one of our themes today. So um, implementation science is the scientific study of methods and strategies that facilitate the uptake of evidence based practice and research into regular use by practitioners and policymakers. So basically, how do we when we develop all this great new technology, how do we get. Uh, audiologists to use it, uh, health systems to use it, and patients to use it. So that's um, so we turn to our keynote speaker to help us figure this out. So um, Dr. Tina Stutz is an associate professor of pediatrics and an implementation science, an implementation scientist in the dissemination and implementation science program at the University of Colorado and Shoots Medical Campus. So in her role with the um, disse Dissemination and Implementation Science Program, she provides consultation, mentoring, and teaching on implementation science with a focus on context, adaption, adaptation, adaption, and underserved communities. And Tina's recent grant funded projects include a five year hybrid effectiveness implementation trial of a parent training and duration intervention adapted for parents of children who use hearing aids or co cochlear implants and a rapid stakeholder engaged project assessing effects on hearing health care for children who are deaf or hard of hearing during COVID-19. So, as you can see, while um, Tina is an implementation scientist, she's also audiology adjacent and her research, her current research is funded by the NIDCD. So it's, we're so excited to hear what you have to tell us today. So welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. It's going to take me 1 second to share my screen appropriately <laughs> because I am in a spaceship, with this, which has 3 screens in it and. Um, it's hard for me to pick the right 1. let's see if I get it on the 1st try. You got it. Got it. Okay. Um, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. This is a topic. This is my career is implementation science. And so I'm really excited to be here to have the opportunity to talk with you about it. And how implementation science and implementation research methods um, can be applied to your own work. And so when Jill first talked with me about coming to speak with you, I did a little digging to see um, what kind of work you all do and what kind of research and practice you're involved in. And I think that um, as the last year has clearly demonstrated with COVID and rapid shifts to telehealth and teleaudiology across the world, um, we know that implementation isn't as easy as just having something available and delivering it. There's a lot more that goes into it than that. So I gave a lot of thought to what I wanted to present today, and I'm not actually going to present on my own research per se. I'll reference it a little bit, but it's very specific around um, parenting and child behavior and psychosocial issues among young children who are deaf or hard of hearing and who use um, cochlear implants or hearing aids. 
and this is how I sort of became connected with the field of audiology as well as speech and language pathology and how I um, ended up getting some funding from NIDCD at the National Institutes of Health to work with this population. So I work closely um, with a bunch of people in hearing health care, even though I am a social worker and a biostatistician and an implementation scientist. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I do have some relevant relationships to disclose, and I'm not going to read them out loud. I'll just have them up here, but they're mostly um, I do some consulting and mentoring for the American Speech Language, uh, Speech, Language and Hearing Association, and then have grant funding and reviews for the National Institutes of Health, as well as some research consulting. So first, I just want to say much appreciation to Jill for inviting me to Brie for doing amazing behind the scenes work in technology and organizational support for the conference and to help me be able to present um, and uh, Valeri and the organizing committee and all of you for being here. <clears throat> the theme, what I'm going to talk about in this um, presentation, first of all, is a quick introduction and or brush up on implementation science if it's something that you're already familiar with. I want to talk with you about some major themes in implementation science and their relevance to delivering high quality care to persons with hearing problems. And then I'm going to give you some resources in terms of annual conferences, biennial conferences, and online resources that you can easily explore on your own, including webinars and toolkits if you are interested in um, integrating some implementation science perspectives into your own work. So we'll start with what is implementation science? So I apologize to people who are extremely knowledgeable about this field already. You might find this bit to be a little bit of a review. Um, Jill mentioned this in the introduction. It's basically the scientific study of how we get practitioners and policymakers and organizations intervention delivery um, to use evidence-based practice and to translate research into real world settings. And implementation science overlaps with a lot of other fields, including quality improvement, um, knowledge translation, improvement science, delivery science, and program science. And so one of the kind of key elements of implementation science is that it is extremely transdisciplinary. And it's almost impossible to do any of this work without a strong team of people representing different fields. So when I say I'm an implementation scientist, that means that I work with people on topics like lung cancer screening, sexual risk reduction using Facebook interventions, um, online delivery of executive function interventions in school settings. So I have the opportunity as kind of a methods person to work with people in a wide range of diseases and interventions. Um, and then my own work really does focus primarily on parents of children who are deaf and hard of hearing. So one study is around um, adapting an evidence-based parenting program and finding a way to deliver it effectively um, that is, a, that is uh, acceptable for scale up and also sustainability. And then I also have a study uh, where we are implementing and we're testing the effectiveness and implementation of a patient navigator intervention to help uh, parents get their infants who have failed their newborn hearing screens in for diagnostic testing in a um, timely manner. So I'm lucky enough to work a lot with people in hearing health care. This slide is one of my favorites, and this is uh, taken from Jeff Curran, who is a leading implementation scientist as well in the US. Um, he, he recognized, as many of us do when we're in this field, that it is sort of a tower of Babel, and there are a lot of jargon and lingo, and when you start investigating this field, it's sometimes challenging to get through the language. And so he took some time to come up with these simple definitions over the last 15 years that he's been teaching in this field. So when we talk about these terms, and when I talk about them in this talk, the intervention or practice or innovation, like teleaudiology or services that you're delivering online, is the thing. Effectiveness research, which everyone is familiar with, is where we look at whether the thing works, especially in kind of outside of tightly controlled, randomized controlled trials. Implementation research looks at how we can best help people, places, organizations, systems do the thing. Implementation strategies are the stuff we try to do to help people in places do the thing. So they're sort of a higher level of an intervention. And then the main implementation outcomes that we're usually interested in are how much and how well they do the thing when we use the stuff that we try to do to help them do the thing. So I really love this slide because 
it's understandable without having to get kind of tangled up in the language of implementation science. The other important thing to um, keep in mind is that implementation science has some really big questions that we are seeking to answer. So one of them is this, what works, for whom, how, in what context, and with what outcomes? So we always hear stories of interventions or innovations that work really well in one place, but for some reason they just never catch on or aren't delivered well or aren't received well in another. And we really wanna understand why that is. That's one of the things that implementation science seeks to um, understand. Another is, if you build it, will they come? <laughs> so usually I use a field of dreams picture here, but like I started to realize that that is sort of dated now. Like sometimes I do this talk and people don't know what field of dreams is. And also this is an international conference. So I don't know how many of you were subjected to that movie starring Kevin Costner. So instead, I took an example from Monday's chat. Um, so this was during the panel after Monday's amazing keynote session. Somebody posted in the chat, we rolled out a trial of certain appointments being available online for patients with hearing aids, but no one has yet opted for this. I'm not sure why, maybe it's because it's a new service. So what we do know is that if you build it, people will not necessarily come. <laughs> and the people who you hope are gonna use it may not actually deliver it at all. So we need to kind of come up with some understanding of why that is. And then the biggest question, so this is a slide that um, Russ Glasgow, who I'll talk about in a little bit, has developed and used for years. And it's the big question, which is if an intervention works or an innovation and nobody can use it, does it still make an impact? So the title of my talk has to do with public health impact. And I'm interested in how we get things that actually have been shown to work out into the real world so that it impacts people in all communities and we actually have a public health impact instead of just um, this very limited implementation and sites that we already know can deliver it. So in traditional health research, we typically are testing an intervention or we might have an, an intervention that has some evidence for it. And what we're interested in are the health outcomes of that intervention. So questions like, if I deliver this service via, via teleaudiology, do I get um, patient satisfaction? Do we improve their symptoms and their quality of life? Um, and so depending on the field, you might have a range of symptoms and health status that you're looking at. But in implementation research, we're interested in slightly different outcomes. So these are sort of the outcomes that precede those patient level health outcomes. And so this first box are the implementation outcomes we're really interested in. So what's the feasibility of actually delivering this intervention? How well is it delivered? That's fidelity. Penetration, who delivers it? How many people? Um, is it actually becoming part of usual care? Is it acceptable to a range of stakeholders? Is it sustainable? Um, do people use it when we provide it to them as a tool in their services toolkit? And importantly, what are the costs? So is it worth the effort to get people to deliver the service this way? So these are proctors um, implementation outcomes. They're pretty prevalent in most implementation science research. I wanted to come up with some examples of questions that implementation science methods might help you answer um, in your field. And there's work on all of these topics going on. So when we get to the panel, I know that the other panelists are actively engaged in answering some of these questions. So how can we increase access to teleaudiology? Tele tele how can we best deliver these services? What are the barriers to teleaudiology and how can we address them? Why did this intervention work at location X, but not location Y? This is constantly a question and location could be a clinic. It could be an organization. It could be a region. It could be a country. So some things work in some places and they don't seem to work as well in others. And we're not always sure why that is. Can I adapt the, a specific intervention to be delivered via telehealth and have it work just as well as when we deliver it in person? That's a question that's really relevant when you're coming up with innovative ways to deliver services online. And then finally, how do we ensure that our teleaudiology services are equitable? So I was able to attend a couple of the earlier keynotes and this was a huge issue. People talked about this in the chat and the keynotes and the panels talked about it. Um, health equity and equitable services is really important when you're trying to deliver this. And we know that there's a digital divide. We know that it's possible that delivering some services online, while it kind of overcomes some barriers to access, it actually might create some barriers to access for some populations. And so how do we keep equity in mind as we start delivering innovative interventions in different ways? So in implementation science, we use a zillion 
theories and frameworks. And I'm not going to talk about them because it's a little overwhelming, honestly, and um, people tend to have their favorites and they use them a lot. There are many of them. Um, there's this amazing website that my colleague Borshika Rabin, who's at UC San Diego, has developed and kind of cultivated over the years, disseminateimplementation.org. You can explore more theories and frameworks than you would ever want to explore and just get an idea of the range that's out there. But I'm going to talk about one because my focus today is on public health impact um, that is very broadly useful and used a lot in um, many fields, public health, um, but also implementation science, and that's REAIM. So for those of you who may not be familiar with REAIM, um, it was developed by Russ Glasgow. He works with me at the University of Colorado in our dissemination and implementation program. Um, and he was responding to this issue that public health impact depends on more than just whether an intervention works. What really matters is even if an intervention is 100% effective and it, it reaches those outcomes that you're looking for in every patient that you deliver it to, it's really only as good as who receives it and who doesn't receive it or who uses it or delivers it and who doesn't and how well or not well it's actually delivered. And then finally, whether it and its effects are sustained over time or not. So if you have an effective intervention that doesn't get out into the real world, its public health impact is just by definition completely limited. So REAM consists of five dimensions and I'll give you a quick overview of what they are. Um, the, the acronym stands for REACH Effectiveness, Adoption, Implementation, and Maintenance. So REACH and Effectiveness are individual level outcomes that we're interested in. So this, in, in our setting, this would be patients. And then Adoption, Implementation, and Maintenance are dimensions that are related to the setting, organization, or system where an intervention is um, hopefully going to be delivered. So REACH is um, looking at, not, at who is intended to benefit and what proportion of those people actually receive the intervention. And then of those who receive it, are they representative of all of those who benefit? Or are the only people receiving this intervention sort of like, you know, middle class, um, majority race, ethnicity, higher socioeconomic status people who can get into the very best clinics? Like, are they receiving it, but nobody else is? If that's the case, then we would say that the reach is inadequate and not representative. Effectiveness is what we always think of. So what patient level effects are achieved with an intervention. Um, but we also care in implementation scientists about what negative or unintended outcomes may occur, which is not something that we always look at in our effectiveness trials. So we are interested in unintended consequences of interventions. Adoption is um, what sites, organizations, agencies, um, regions like actually apply or deliver a program policy or intervention who actually applies it within those settings and then are they representative of all of the sites or settings who could be adopting it implementation is about how well a program or policy or intervention is delivered whether and how it's adapted or changed from what it was originally designed to be and also how much it costs and then finally, maintenance is really the sustainability question. So when you have staff turnover or a policy change or somebody who was really the champion for this thing leaves your agency, does it continue to be sustained over time or does it just kind of fade away because nothing is driving it? And then there's an additionally an individual level maintenance question about how long are the effects of the intervention or the innovation sustained at the individual or patient level. So the question of like why these domains are important or these dimensions are important is illustrated in this slide. So say we have, and of course, okay, this is not a biostatistical slide. <laughs> these percentages are sort of, this is just like an analogy. So say we have an exceptionally um, effective intervention that we've tested in efficacy and um, effectiveness trials, and we wanna get it out into the real world. So if only half of the settings who we hope would actually use it um, go ahead and adopt the intervention and deliver it, then our, our impact has been pretty much cut in half immediately. If within those delivering institutions, agencies, or clinics, only half of the eligible providers decide to deliver the intervention, so only half of the people think they like teleology and they're not going to do it, um, they're going to do it, but the other half of the people aren't, then we have another cut of about half of our impact. If of those who are delivering the intervention, only about half of their patients are into it, and the rest of them are like, I don't want to see you online, I'm not interested in online services, then our reach has actually been cut, 
and so our public health impact is lower. If among those who are using teleaudiology services or delivering any kind of innovation, only half of them are doing it well, and the others are kind of, you know, doing kind of whatever they want and it's, it's low fidelity, then in implementation, we have a problem and our public health impact is further reduced. Then maybe this isn't 100% effective intervention and only half of the patients actually benefit from it when they receive it. Our impact lowers again. And then finally, if the effects don't sustain over time, our impact is even further lowered. So you start with this goal of 100% public health impact and you end up just slightly under 2%. And that's a problem. So this is what REAIM is designed for, is that we're not just interested in the effects of the intervention, but how it is actually implemented out in the, re in the real world on these five different dimensions. What we see is that for a lot of interventions or innovations, we have ample effectiveness data. Like we have lots of money and resources spent in the kind of research that shows effectiveness, but limited real world implementation. And to me, most concerning is limited access and acceptability in underserved communities or populations. And when we add those things together, we basically end up with little to no public health impact of what our um, evidence-based interventions or innovations could be offering. Next, I'm gonna run through some major themes in implementation science and their relevance to actually delivering high quality care to persons with hearing problems. So the first theme that you will see in uh, most implementation science research and efforts and practice is context. So this is the idea that um, the content and mechanisms of change and all of those wonderful things in your, in your um, intervention are very important but context is queen and she runs the household. So you cannot ignore the setting in which, the multi-level setting in which you are trying to deliver an intervention or an innovation. So context, as we know, is multi-level. There are multiple domains of context and all of these interact with each other. We don't do a great job yet of understanding this because context is very complex. In addition, Frequently, we ignore the fact that context is also dynamic. So if you think about social norms, acceptability, um, resources, policy, when you think about telehealth, all of these things rapidly changed as soon as COVID-19 hit. Like all of a sudden there was no option for in-person appointments. And so many of the barriers and contextual factors that were preventing people from shifting to telehealth magically disappeared. I mean, and that was partially due to a lot of advocacy and work by people, but suddenly these were barriers that could be overcome and make sure that we could deliver telehealth services. And that was a context, that was a dynamic contextual change. And in the future, we don't know yet what's going to happen. Um, you know, people maybe are more accepting of it, but already in certain places, uh, like in the US, the reimbursement for telehealth services has gone down. And so will they sustain it or not? That's a contextual factor that's influencing implementation. So there are a, a lot of frameworks in implementation science that look specifically at context and particular um, factors that are related to how well or whether an intervention is implemented. There are too many of them to cover and they're all a little bit complicated. And so I just wanted to focus on this socio-ecological model that many people are familiar with, especially if you're in public health at all, where each level is nested inside the other. And you can't ignore any of these levels because there are individual level barriers and facilitators, and there are policy and system level barriers and facilitators, and all of them influence, like in every one of these levels, whether something is implemented and how. The next major theme that I wanna talk about is adaptations. And so um, if you are a hardcore experimental researcher looking at efficacy, fidelity is kind of the most important thing about how an intervention is delivered. But what we know is that when evidence-based interventions get out into the real world, they are very rarely delivered the way that we think that they are, even in some trials, adaptations happen that may not actually be described or recognized because people change things a little bit. Like they use WebEx instead of Zoom or they use the phone instead of video conferencing or they change the duration of sessions or somebody else checks the patient in other than who was originally supposed to. So these adaptations happen sometimes in a planned way and sometimes just kind of organically as implementation happens. And the goal is usually to improve the fit of the innovation or the implementation or the um, intervention at kind of multiple levels. So either for the patient, 
the provider, for the clinic, for the health system, for the location. Um, but this highlights this tension between adaptation and fidelity or flexibility and fidelity. So if, if we see that adaptation is probably inevitable in the real world, then maybe we should stop fighting it and, and viewing adaptation and fidelity as these two warring factions or these superheroes who are against each other. And instead, we should just acknowledge that they sort of coexist and there has to be a little bit of flex to be able to make something work in the real world. So if there are going to be adaptations, which there probably are, it would be preferable if they were systematic, if they were thought about ahead of time, and then if they happen more organically or in the process of implementation, if they were tracked. The theme of equity we talked about a minute ago, and this is something that um, has really only, I would say, like in the last five years, become more of a pressing issue in implement implementation science. Um, so it used to be, you know, we just want to get get innovations or interventions out into the real world. And now there's this recognition that sometimes implementation efforts can actually widen the gap between populations who are doing well and aren't, or who are benefiting from interventions and who aren't. And so there have been several really recent important articles written about this. This is actually one of my favorites by Anna Bauman and Leo Cabasa, where we talk about um, how to reframe implementation to think about inequities from the very beginning. And so thinking about things like reach and representativeness of who your innovation or your intervention is going to reach before you even start implementation. And think about your patient population or communities who are experiencing health inequities right up front and make them a target of your implementation efforts because people who can get your services are probably going to get them no matter what. It's the people who aren't receiving them or who are at risk of being left behind who we really need to target. Um, we need to develop the science of adaptation. So that includes cultural adaptations too, like how do we make something work for communities who maybe have mistrust of the medical profession where they are or who have historically not received um, equitable care? And then just generally using this equity lens for implementation outcomes throughout. Multi-level implementation strategies is a really important theme and you'll see why in just a second, um, because the question would be, what is the most common implementation strategy that we use when we're trying to deliver a new intervention? So as a reminder, the implementation strategy would be the stuff that we do to try to help people do the thing. So how do we get providers to deliver teleaudiology services? Like, how do we do this? So the answer, the most common implementation strategy is education or training for the providers or the staff who are going to be doing the thing. The problem is, um, and that's kind of the go-to, right? Like we do CEUs or we do special trainings. We just want to get people up to speed on what this new innovation is. The problem is that education and training of providers is rarely effective on its own. And this is because it usually targets knowledge and maybe skill, but there are other barriers that exist at all different levels, like people's beliefs and their attitudes and their prior experience, patient preferences and people's thoughts about patient preferences, like what they perceive patient preferences to be versus what maybe they really are, and financial incentives and disincentives or leadership support, or infrastructure and resources. So there are tons of multi-level barriers to implementation beyond just the provider knows how to do it or doesn't know how to do it. So it's really crucial to understand multi-level barriers to implementation, and then in response, select multi-level implementation strategies to address them. So this is complicated and it's, it's challenging. There are examples. Um, this is an excellent article if you ever are interested in looking at it. There's this expert recommendations for implementing change or the ERIC project that is um, continually sort of being updated and used in implementation research where there's a list of basically like all of the implementation strategies that we could come up with from experts in the field. So this would include things like computerized reminders or audit and feedback or um, kind of cultivating clinical champions or providing incentives or disincentives um, to teams or providers. So there's a whole ton of strategies beyond just training that really should be considered and then really thoughtfully selected at different um, levels. The next thing I'll talk about quickly is considering implementation early and often. So this is one of the things that I'm a huge fan of. I tend to do these things called hybrid trials, which I'll talk about in just a second. 
Um, but this idea is that implementation isn't really something that should just come in at the end. So you've done, you've developed something cool, you've done some efficacy trials, you've got an evidence base, you do some effectiveness trials, and then you're like, hey, let's get this out there into the real world and have people deliver it. So if you wait to look at implementation until that point, it is possible that you have developed something that just isn't going to work in the real world or that people don't actually want. <laughs> so it's really helpful to think about implementation from the very, very beginning of developing or adapting or um, enhancing some sort of intervention. And that includes just delivering something in a different way, like delivering something online versus in person. You should be thinking about implementation right from the beginning. So this is kind of uh, falls under this umbrella term of designing for dissemination. There have been some really recent papers about this. Um, focused on the importance of kind of moving this into people's intervention development and early testing of interventions. On this slide, I gave you a couple of resources. These are very like hands-on resources about it. Um, but designing for dissemination isn't just about dissemination, it's also about implementation and designing for sustainability. So keeping these things in mind from the very beginning. Related to this um, are these things called hybrid trials. So this is also um, a development by Jeff Curran, who was the one with the slide about the thing. Um, he, he kind of came up with this idea that why do we need to go through this process of efficacy trials followed by effectiveness trials followed by implementation trials? That just slows us down. And the whole point of implementation science is really to speed translation into practice. So hybrid trials are this very clever way of putting effectiveness and implementation um, purposefully together in your research. It can even be efficacy and implementation together in your research. So the idea here is that clinical effectiveness research or efficacy research and implementation research don't have to be separated. We can actually bring them together. Um, he kind of posits three different models for this. So a type one is where you're really doing an effectiveness trial or an efficacy trial, but you collect some implementation data to inform how you're actually gonna get this out into the real world if you find that it works. So you might start by collecting um, data on implementation outcomes or barriers and facilitators. And then a type three is at the other end of the spectrum where you've got something that you know is evidence-based, you are going to um, test implementation strategies. So we know it works, we just wanna see, do we need training and audit and feedback and incentives? Or do we need training alone? Like, I want to see what works best. But at the same time, you're going to be looking at your patient level outcomes, your effectiveness outcomes, so that you know that however you're shifting your delivery of this intervention, you're still paying attention to the patient level effectiveness outcomes. And then in the middle are these type twos, which in theory sort of equally value effectiveness and implementation. I'll run quickly through some other key issues and then wrap up. Um, these are things that are just kind of core tenets of implementation research. The first is engaging multi-level stakeholders through the entire process. So through identifying the problem you want to address, um, developing an intervention, implementing an intervention, and sustaining an intervention. So this means parents, like patients, caregivers, providers, staff, administrators, payers, policymakers, like the entire range of stakeholders should really be involved in this kind of work because you never know when you're gonna hit a barrier, right? You wanna kind of like get people's buy-in and make sure that what you're doing is workable at all levels from the very beginning. And that if there needs to be, for example, a policy change, um, if you're in the US, for example, if you come up with something that um, insurance won't cover or that Medicare or Medicaid won't cover, then you're going down a dead road. Like you need to think of that upfront. So this is an important um, just basically premise of implementation science. Sustainment is a question that has previously not been paid enough attention to in implementation science. Lots of our grant funded work is only you know, a max of five years. And so it's really hard to look at sustainment and how long something lasts um, in, the, in the span of a grant. And so we need more real world information on sustainment and what factors make an implementation or make an innovation sustainable in the long run. So there's some excellent resources here um, called the Program Sustainability Assessment Tool and the Clinical Sustainability Assessment Tool developed by Doug Luke. 
And um, I encourage you to look at these if, if sustainment is something you're interested in, because he's trying to work on identifying what is necessary and needed to be able to sustain innovations or implementations in real world settings. Costs are also extremely important, have been ignored in the past, um, but are crucial because as we know, cost is one of the main drivers of whether something will be adopted, implemented, and sustained. Mixed methods, so if you're a researcher, um, for a lot of the things we're interested in implementation science, we don't have valid quantitative measures for them yet. They're kind of under development, but we really have to do a lot of creative focus groups and observation and key informant interviews in addition to quantitative assessments and then triangulate those where possible um, to get kind of a richer understanding of what's going on in implementation. And then finally, these pragmatic research designs. So these studies take place in the real world because um, it doesn't make sense to study them in a perfect setting because no settings are going to be like your setting. So we really want to think about things like participant burden, whether randomization is really acceptable, um, how we're going to do primary data collection, and what the competing demands are of the settings that we're working with. So, for example, um, I originally wanted to study uh, parenting interventions in rural primary care practices um, and integrating them into rural primary care until the primary care providers told me in rural Appalachia that they had such a high burden of obesity, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, you know, in their older patients, there's no way that they were possibly going to look at prevention, you know, in early childhood behavioral issues. So this was not on their radar. So there's a lot of community demands and we have to fit into what's important to the sites that we're working with. So just a review of these are kind of the questions, uh, an example of some of the questions that you can answer. And hopefully I've given you um, a little bit of information about each one of these types of questions and how they can be addressed in this area. And I want to give you a few resources before I wrap up. So there, um, this is just a taste of resources. So if you Google implementation science training or implementation science webinars, newsletters, you're going to find a huge amount of resources that you can access. Um, there is this kind of this annual conference on the science of DNI, which is co-sponsored by Academy Health and NIH here in the US. And this past year it was offered online. It's an excellent way to get introductory information as well as really advanced information on what is going on in the field. There's a global implementation conference. Um, when it's in person, the site varies. It was, uh, it was also online last year. It just happened, I think in May. And so the next conference will be in 2023. This is in Australia, the Evidence and Implementation Summit, which has developed out of two other conferences. Um, another one that is excellent and was delivered online um, also in 2023. There are some implementation science training programs. Uh, UC San Francisco is really known for this. Um, Sick Kids in Toronto, Canada has a knowledge translation training workshop that is excellent um, and offered usually a few times a year. And here are just some like general websites that you can go to where you can get all sorts of information about training resources, um, important articles, workshops, and webinars. And then on this last page, this is my institution, so I want to push these too. So um, this is more information about our dissemination and implementation science program. This is a conference we have coming up later this month. It's a, it's a three year conference series, and this one is on pragmatic research and health. Um, it's coming up later this month. It's very affordable and completely online. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and look it up. And then finally, this is the certificate program that I teach in. It's an international program, so we have students from other countries, we have students from the US. Um, it's mostly people who are either uh, doctoral students, postdocs, or clinicians. We have some mid career researchers who are kind of shifting into implementation science. So it's a 12 credit fully online certificate program. If you're interested, you can look that up as well. That is it. Thank you so much for letting me come and speak with you. And I hope it was interesting. And um, Jill, let me know if you have any questions right off the bat before we start the panel. Well, um, thank you, Tina. That was just wonderful. Um, I, I didn't, we are actually right and now at our time for the panel and we have a few questions specifically for you, but I, I, I would like to go right to the panel so that we can, um, and then people can repost questions. Um, if they want, if they want those to be answered. Yeah. No problem. I, so, because I want to get our great panelists on, but that was wonderful and I didn't stop you because all the information was so important and so useful. 
and really applies to things that I'm thinking about. So I assume it's what everybody else is thinking about. So anyway, I, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, so they're coming up here. Oh, great. We can see, we can see them now. So um, we have, um, well, I'll start with what I can see. Um, we have a uh, duet of Swanapool. Um, Devet is a professor of audiology at the University of Pretoria in South Africa and editor in chief of the International Journal of Audiology. His research capitalizes on digital health technologies to explore, develop, and evaluate innovative hearing services for greater access and affordability. And he's also founder of a digital health company called the HearX Group. We have Adam Beckman, who's the head of audiology for Plymouth Hospital's um, NHS Trust in Southwest England. He has spent the last 13 months trying to develop options for patients to help them hear better using the right approach for them in the context of a global pandemic. And we have Chad Gladden, who is the audiology telehealth coordinator for the, v, the VA Audiology and Speech Pathology National Program Office. And he is a national spokesperson for the advancement of teleaudiology and services on numerous national committees dealing with connected care within the VA. So I'm really excited because we, we have people in, in public um, health services, private health services. Um, so I think this will be a really interesting discussion. So I'm going to ask each of you to just speak for a few minutes on um, issues that you're working on now that you think are really important in terms of implementation. And um, Adam, would you like to start us off? Um, okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I now feel like I'm a complete fraud because I'm a, not an implementation scientist or, or even much of a scientist, really. I just kind of get on and do my job. Um, but I've been was thinking whilst um, Tina was talking, which was brilliant, by the way, thank you, um, about implementation in audiology that I've been involved in. Um, so many years ago, I was involved in the Modernising Hearing Aid Services Programme in the UK, um, and I, it was that was kind of a small cog in a very big implementation change. That's big, one of the two largest changes in audiology in the UK. Um, and since then I've been in Plymouth and I've been here for 16 years now. And really I kind of always think about what's helping my patients. And I'm gonna come back to why I think this is important. But when there are developments, um, whether it's uh, the option of assess and fit using thin tube, whether it's frequency compression for people with severe or profound hearing losses, I've always kind of audited what we've done here and thought about how the patients in Plymouth are benefiting from, from these developments. Um, and I'm a bit of a show off, so I tend to share what I've done, even if it wasn't very good. Um, and then we kind of we think about remote care and we've got a weird population here. And I don't mean weird as in the people, but we've got a very urban centre with some very deprived areas. We've also got a very rural area. So I have really wanted remote care for a long time. Um, and we were actually just getting ready to start doing some remote fine tuning and fitting of hearing aids. Um, we were going to launch the week after we got shut down by COVID. And as a result of that, it meant that we were actually ready to go with remote fitting and remote aftercare um, straight away. And we did our first fitting within a week of being closed down by the national shutdown here in the UK, or in England, I should say. There were different dates in the other countries and I must be careful about that. Um, because we were ready for that here, I, I was able to kind of help other services in, in, in finding out how we'd done it and how, how they could therefore do it. And I think that, that really it boils down to, um, just trying to choose the right words now, um, people think of the NHS as the NHS, but there isn't an NHS. There's over 200 different organisations. And when their people are trying to make changes, actually those changes are de developed locally according to the needs of that population, but also according to the interests of the people who sit in chairs like mine, the heads of service and the service leads in all those different places. So if you're trying to implement change across a wide scale in the UK, what you actually do is appeal to lots and lots of different people and appeal to their own particular interests and their own particular desires. It's been really interesting coming to some of these other meetings because 
over the last 15 months, patients have had no choice but to accept remote care and telecare and teleaudiology. That's changing. Face-to-face -face, um, appointments are back. And, 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 and I think the big challenge for us is to think about how do we maintain the best bits of what we've learned and what people have had to um, take up? Um, and how do we keep that momentum moving rather than just drifting back into what worked before or what seemed to work before? Um, and doing that at scale is going to be extremely interesting, I think. And I'll stop there. Uh, thanks. Um, how about Chad? How about what, what do you let us know what you've been thinking about? Yes, I, I found this presentation or this opportunity just to be wonderful because it hits home, at least for me, the role that I'm a part of, and, and it's really the work of the, the field um, within the VA that um, you look to represent. But um, I, I do oversee at least um, a portfolio, a wide variety of um, services, whether it's synchronous services, remote programming, remote diagnostic, um, live video conferencing types of applications, asynchronous um, uh, formats, um, looking at storing and sending information to an audiologist to, to review secure messaging, uh, mobile health. Um, but thinking about, I think, things that hit home for me, at least listening to that presentation is the, the idea of this implementation and thinking about that from the beginning, because we've looked at um, small single site pilots, um, really taking a very systematic uh, approach as far as how that information or those technologies or modalities have gone out and being able to really to take a uh, evidence-based approach where we are using at least uh, feedback from patients and that really being the focal point um, for you know a lot of these services coming to fruition. Um, getting the feedback consistently and frequently from at least frontline providers on how we kind of go through and take various services really to kind of to, to, to bring them to the forefront and so that they are used. Looking at some of those barriers or the elements that really do um, create some problems or why the uh, adoption has been uh, less frequent, um, even when we've uh, kind of gone through with refined protocols, looking at, you know, some of the education and training uh, components that are there. Um, so uh, there was just a number of things that I think are really exciting. Um, I think from just the experience standpoint, what we've done, that re framework is something that has been um, pretty significant, at least any of the work that we've done within the VA. Um, and so I, I, I just, I like how this kind of comes together and really looking forward actually to the discussion and the questions that come in from the field, so. Great, thank you. And Vet, how about tell us what you've been thinking about? Thank you, Joel, and thank you very much, Tina. That was a, a wonderful overview of implementation science. You certainly educated us on, on the complexities, but also the importance of the, this entire field. Um, so the context that I'm doing a lot of the work in with many colleagues at the moment is really in underserved areas of the world where there are very few services available to people. So implementation science uh, by nature becomes very important because it's about how do we develop new services that are sustainable, that are impactful, that can actually, you know, um, serve patients on the long haul. So, and, and I think that touches on a lot of the, the frameworks that you also mentioned, Tina, and I think that's very helpful to understand a little bit more about the details. I, unfortunately, I, I realized even when you were presenting that I, I definitely don't know enough about the field of implementation science, even though we touch on it all the time and it does have a thread throughout the work that we're doing. So um, maybe just to give some practical examples. So we, we use innovative technologies um, that are available in underserved contexts. A lot of this mobile types of technologies, connectivity is important um, as part of that. But also we utilize those technologies with healthcare workers who are minimally trained lay health workers or community health workers because those resources are just not available. Traditional services are not available and traditional hearing healthcare professionals are not available. So we try to combine those. But by nature, that means we have to look at how do we translate the discoveries, the validated technologies that enable these new models, um, but how do you translate them in tangible, practical way, ways that 
will ensure these services are workable, that they're applied and that they um, can have an impact, not just in one project, but actually on the long haul. So, 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 so I think I think there's a lot of touch points there that's really important for us. We we try to embed implementation science in our implementation or in, in our feasibility and efficacy studies and field studies so that we can be, inform um, the practice from both qualitative and quantitative um, data, but also to make sure that we're actually implementing real life services. And, and I think that's really important. That's been extremely helpful for us to have an iterative approach as well, where we implement services to the best of our current knowledge and uh, the best uh, you know, technologies at our expo disposal. But we want to go in very flexible so that we are quick to adapt and change based on the data we get. And I think that's also one of the features of implementation science, because it's a real world science, you need to um, be flexible and be able to adapt and pivot and change the direction as you get um, the data coming in. Um, so, so maybe that's for some of the thoughts from mine, maybe just one more la a last thought as we kind of continue this discussion is, is COVID, I think, has certainly required us to rethink much of what we have done, the way we're doing it. And uh, I think implementation science has certainly, you know, be served as a kind of bridge towards making these changes that have started to, to make sure that those changes continue and, and, and become an integral part of the way in which audiological services, hearing healthcare services will be delivered into the future so that we're providing more equitable, more accessible and um, uh, services that are more widely available as well. So I think it's an opportunity. Definitely. Thank you. Um, I, I really, I really appreciate it, Tina, when you were talking in, in your talk, talking about sustainability, because I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, and I think that that's what you've been thinking about, too, what, what you're talking about as well. So I'm going to go and look at those papers that you recommended for us. Okay, so let's um, go to, su to some of the questions that we have. And this question came from Tina's talk, but I think it applies to everybody here, which is who do you think are the key stakeholders in driving implementation of evidence-based science in general and for your work in particular? And I'm wondering, um, and, and to, to add to that question, um, and wh where do you maybe find that you have to spend your most time with which group of stakeholders? So, um, um, Tina, do you wanna start with that? I'll give a quick answer to that and then turn it over to people who are actually doing this in your field, <laughs> because I'm sure they all have experiences with this. And it, it, uh, the short answer is it depends because it depends on what the intervention is. It depends on, um, the context that you're in. Really, that's what, that's what depends. And so, um, in my own work, I have been working uh, with kind of administrators at specific um, clinics who are trying to integrate a service into what we're doing, working with um, the payers and kind of in this setting, it's like state level administrators who are over kind of the financial um, decision making for specific sites, um, but also patients like so the, the actual recipients of the intervention, as well as the frontline staff. So, you know, it, it really does depend on what it is that you're trying to do. Anybody who ends up touching it in any way and having any power over whether it happens or not, or whether there's uptake or not, those are the people that you need to have involved. And I will say that um, when I first started uh, my research career, I wasn't doing implementation science, but I was doing sort of this community engaged um, health promotion interventions in rural Appalachia. And I was working with an anthropologist who had these amazing relationships with community members in these counties who were a little resistant, you know, to having university people or outside people coming in to do things to them or for them. And so I really learned this premise of walking alongside your stakeholders, you know, valuing them as the experts. And at first I couldn't get used to going out there and spending a whole day kind of chit chatting and eating lunch, getting to know them and seeing pictures of their kids. And, you know, it was crazy to me because I was this kind of quantitative intervention researcher, but those relationships and your ability to partner with people and have those people bring more people in, you know, setting up a community advisory board, for example, that includes not only policymakers, but parents or children, if that's who you're working with, 
just thinking broadly about stakeholders and putting the time in that's that's probably the hardest part because people know when they're just being used you know or they're you're checking a box that you've checked with them versus actually valuing their opinions as the true experts in what it is that you're trying to do great thank you um oh, and i can't help but think that implements implementation scientists around the world are busy working on vaccine rollouts and keeping them going that's that so true <laughs> that is so true i mean it's it's like a natural experiment happening right now yeah so um so how about for the rest of our panelists can you talk about the stakeholders that you're thinking about the most or working with the most or having difficulty with the most anybody who would like to start Jill, maybe I can share one or two thoughts just to kind of uh, touch on what Tina also mentioned. I think the context is uh, king here, I mean, or queen, uh, maybe, but, <laughs> but it, it does dictate, you know, the kind of stakeholders that you have to involve. But the community itself is, is probably the most important stakeholder. You need to be able to engage with the community. And oftentimes that means you may not be the right um, person or the right group to engage with them. So you, you probably need to work through NGOs, through other community leaders and community groups who can facilitate those relationships and build the trust that you need in community. So, so for us, it's always important, essential to work with local NGOs that understand the context, that um, have a vested interest also in the types of um, interventions that we work with. And, and, and they're, they're usually our strongest partners in, in these um, uh, community-based projects. So those are very important, but then of course you have to spread it across all the levels. So it's a multi-stakeholder, multi-level um, partnership that you have to put together. And, and that's why collaborations are so important. Um, uh, and, and I agree with um, Tina that relationships are at the core of what makes for a successful intervention, I think, with implementation. So, so for us, it's the community. It's also um, the, the actual beneficiaries of the treatment. So whether that's the parents or the children that you have to engage with, get their perspectives, understand what the barriers are for them and what, what the desired outcomes are for them. Sometimes we have envisioned certain outcomes and that may not be the outcomes that they value. So, so we may need to make sure that we match those and um, those needs and expectations. And then of course, it's always important to also not just have those grassroots levels engagements, but also a little bit higher up policy um, department of basic education in our instance, or department of health, and to have those stakeholders involved. And I, I don't think it's a either or, it's, it's, it has to run in parallel. Um, do we have comments from either of our other panelists? Yeah, if I can, I'll just um, say it. from our perspective, I think it's, the work we're doing it's really that the frontline uh, audiologists and the patients are the two groups that that really we need to get buy-in from um, the patients and the service users are the ones who are going to be using this technology day to day and anything that we do has to have their buy-in um, and the audiologists are their conduit to getting that so those are the two groups I feel very fortunate because here we don't have to worry in the same way about kind of the financial side of it as in other countries. We're not worried about whether Medicare or Medicaid are going to pay for the work that we do. Um, so that's a whole stakeholder that we don't have to worry about in the same way. Um, but it, it's key is getting into the patients and getting them to, to use what's on offer. Um, but the other side of it I see, think about is that those that aren't taking it up we gain headroom to work with the people that can't access the new technology because of those that can and that frees us up in terms of time and effort and energy to work with those who aren't in a position to use that technology whether because of their um i'm going to say age age isn't isn't a barrier um in general uh, per se but certainly amongst the older age group it's a bit more of a barrier for technological take up um, we would say, although our oldest person to use the remote care that we've got is 96. So um, I don't like these generalizations overall. Um, I'll st stop there. Okay. Well, oh, I was going to ask Chad a question, but I'll wait till he comes back. Um, so an another question that we have. Um, I, oh, oh, Chad, you are back. Okay. So, Chad, to follow no, up that on was, <laughs> the timing on that was just bad. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. But no, I just I think that the um, 
you know, Adam hit on a, a number of key topics. For the VA, some of the, the stakeholders, I, when I think about just the success and the overall size um, and the work that's been done within the VA, um, you know, it really is starting with at least the veteran or the patient. Um, we've got a number of folks to stay engaged. We don't have to worry in the same sense on some of the reimbursement factors. But, um, you know, it, it has been frontline staff. It's been the patient kind of driving the types of technologies or services. Um, it has been, uh, you know, our work on just connectivity elements, but it's biomed, it's IT, from our policymakers for other departments and groups that have been with us. So it really is diverse and um, it's wide ranging. And bringing everybody into the table has been kind of the key. And I think one of the things that we've been successful with as well, um, and why we've been able to kind of do what we've done to the scale of which we've done within the VA and for audiology. So um, I would just catch my breath. Hey, Rhianda kind of to get back just for that one. So anyway, but it, it's a good topic. And I, I'm gonna tell you with wherever the, the place or the location or the technology, um, you know, really identifying those stakeholders who can reach them the best and just realizing just kind of the size and, and bringing really everybody to the table on that is, is such a key element for some of the success and sustainability. Um, thanks. And I want to follow up with that, Chad, with a question that came from Harvey Abrams for you, which is, um, can you describe the characteristics of those clinics that have adopted teleaudiology versus those who have not? Um, for us, I think the, the biggest thing, it really is the buy-in. Um, now, that's maybe a little bit uh, just a different dynamic, at least with the VA. Um, this isn't something that's new to us. I mean, we've been doing teleaudiology or telehealth for well over a decade um, in, you know, a pretty large fashion itself. Um, but I, I do think some of the variability on what individuals have gotten as far as support, whether it's been more of the technical side of things, or it's been, you know, at least on the clinic setups or some of the administrative um, burdens itself. Sometimes it's been, you know, um, some pushback, at least from clinical staff, as far as implementing or feeling that it's maybe a little bit of a subpar service. And I know um, comparatively speaking, um, but I think some of those stigmas and stereotypes have been um, reduced as time has gone on. COVID's definitely kind of um, accelerated at least the adoption and growth where things that um, maybe folks were a little bit more resistance to in the, the past, um, we're opening up some additional opportunities or ways to really to kind of <clears throat> speed up pieces that, um, you know, we had some early adopters, some that um, were a little bit later to join on or just running into different barriers. But um, I, I would tell you overall, I. I I just view within the VA and at least our healthcare system um, where there really is a focus on the quality of care um, as far as that's being done that some, a lot of times in uh, certain scenarios, we can do a better job actually with um, various online services and it isn't viewed as being something that is uh, subpar or second to none. But, um, you know, that, that's really been the, I think some of the core pieces for at least uh, the, the VA itself. Thank you. Um, um, I have a question that I want, wanted to pop one in there that um, I guess mostly for Tina, which is, um, are there, do you see differences in implementation in different healthcare systems? So specifically US based in, in um, government systems like the VA versus public uh, versus pr um, private for-profit and private nonprofit healthcare systems? Yes, definitely. So um, I think Chad Chad was speaking to something when he said, you know, um, financially things are a little bit different. Like the structure of the VA is very different from private practices or you know uh, medical academic centers or academic medical centers. The so so there is this uh, this part of the VA called Query. Chad, you know about Query, right? Like the I can't remember what it stands for though. That's terrible. It's you know. I don't know. Q U it's Q U E R I if you want to look it up. And so basically sure. it's it's like an implementation, it's like a quality improvement and implementation um, program within the VA that for, for those of us who are not in the VA, 
we're frequently really jealous, you know, that the VA has sort of this built in laboratory <laughs> in some ways, you know, so it's still important to get by and you still have to do a lot of the legwork, you know, and connecting with stakeholders and obtaining buy in and implementation strategies. But um, there is more standardization in terms of um, how things can be delivered in the VA. Uh, it's a little bit more of a top down unified system compared to, you know, say you're working with um, private audiology clinics and trying to work with some state audiology clinics in Kentucky, like I've been doing. They're all over the map and there's no kind of guiding. There's no umbrella under which, you know, they fall. And so, uh, and then when you look at other countries, like. Um, I really appreciated Adam's description. I always think of the NHS as like the NHS, but the NHS is really lots of different, you know, settings and lots of different people and you still have to work to get them all um, to buy into something and actually implement it in a systematic way. And at least you don't have to worry about the pay piece, you know, so I think it, it differs so much across. Uh, this is why that kind of context is queen concept is really important. Is it something that works in 1 place is not necessarily. Um, or even maybe rarely going to work the same way in another place. And you have to really look at the unique aspects of that context at multiple levels and which stakeholders are important to engage um, and how you can sort of adapt either what it is that you're doing or the strategies that you're using to try to get it done. Great. Um, here's a question from our from our uh, conference chair from Valeri. Um, so, what role do you think big data possibly combined with AI can play in implementation outcomes? Any thought, I mean, have you been, have any of you been using big data in order to drive some of your, um, in the creation of services and products? I can, I can throw in, I haven't used it myself and if somebody else has, I would love to hear about it, but this is definitely an area of interest. Um, so Doug Luke, again, who I mentioned earlier with the PSAT and the CSAT sustainability measures, um, he also does some systems modeling. So using big data to try to systematically identify factors that are uh, necessary and sufficient for either sustainability or adoption or quality of implementation. I think that, uh, since I am not really a computer science or big data person, I probably don't even appreciate what could be done <laughs> with this kind of data, but I know that others are working in that field for sure. I'm curious if any of our panelists have been able to use it or have partners who are. You know, yes, I mean, I think, I think that's a very good question because um, I, I think the future of implementation science, a lot of it could be driven by, you know, if, if we get the data right, and we can actually use it in these models. It could be a powerful predictor of, of, of what are those key variables that predict outcomes in specific contexts. I think the challenge there is that um, implementation science is so varied and the and the data points are so um, different across different contexts, and it's difficult to capture all of the data points that, 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 that I think it's it's going to be a challenge to get models that are actually going to be you know, a powerful in the near future, but I do think the long term um, potential should be should be very exciting. I think our experience with uh, AI and machine learning and, and big data is more on a clinical level where it's much more controlled. You know what the outcomes are and you can throw in a couple of other variables, collect the data and, and build a good model that can predict certain diagnostic outcomes, for example. But, but but I think in implementation science, um, you, you'll need more data and you'll be have to be more specific about the types of data points you you're going to collect and it needs to be collected in the same way. And, and I think that's probably where the, where the challenge comes in and, and big data means really big data. And, and, and that also means it's expensive because implementation science is an implementation of a service and evaluating it. So, so, so it can become a very costly exercise. Uh, thanks. Um, okay, we'll move on. Um, an, another question that we have was for Devet, but I think and, um, any of you can um, speak to this if you like. Um, and so it was specifically, Devet, you were talking about getting involvement from other uh, pay, uh, other funding models and implementing what you're doing. And so the question was, do you have tips for getting bigger tech companies to implement community projects 
or any pitfalls or advice for involving tech companies and community projects. And I'm wondering also in the VA or in the NHS, if you're also looking for partnerships like that to get things done. I have that exact same question. How, how do we get more support from, from the company? So it's a good question. I don't have the answer and I'd like to get tips from anyone else um, amongst the attendees and the panelists. I mean, I think I think there is a move, um, the whole move about inclusion and uh, equitable healthcare, you know, has put a bigger onus on the kind of social um, social justice as well. So, so that, you know, it, it's one thing to create great technologies, but that cost a fortune and only certain people can can access those. So, so hopefully some of that kind of translates into a willingness to to invest and also produce technologies that can you know include others who are currently entirely excluded i mean if you look at the the recent launch of the world report on hearing uh the majority of the world 80 percent of the world's people with hearing loss are excluded right and um so so so, so there's a big um there's a big drive needed and hopefully uh the whole idea about of inclusion and uh equity um, can be an instigator to kind of build models where where big tech companies can can be more proactive in supporting these projects. Any other comments? There can be sort yeah. of a um, a carrot for certain parts of the industry that if they get involved, if they partner with you um, to do some kind of implementation work in in specific communities, um, this can be. Uh, kind of publicity wise really good for them. So we have had, we have seen some of that. It's not necessarily in audiology, but um, with like pharmaceutical companies, for example, um, we have some researchers here who do implementation work on HPV vaccination and who have partnered with pharmaceutical companies specifically and been funded even sometimes either by industry or by the industry's foundation um, grant funding to, to be able to work together for the common cause, you know, of increasing public health impact, really, but the benefit to the companies um, often is is more around their reputation, you know, and the fact mm -hmm. that they're kind of investing in this sort of work. And so I feel like the personal, you know, connections between it's again some of that relationship building. If you have an in into some sort of industry or organization, often um, you can learn a little bit more about how you might partner together. So one of my colleagues like left academia to go work within a pharmaceutical company because they were specifically interested in implementation of HPV vaccination. And she can actually do so much more, so much more nimbly at a much wider scale than she was able to do um, in an academic setting. So I think there's a huge opportunity. I think there are then kind of ethical and logistical questions too. Um, However, there's a lot of potential there. And Adam, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that that, that we've been thinking quite hard about um, is about take up of, of remote care with with people who don't have access to IT in the same way. Um, and we actually are talking with one of our hearing aid providers about doing some work getting into there. And and there, there's two bits. One, they've got an incentive clearly that if they can work with us then they will get more hearing aids sold. Um, and that's very crude and I don't want to make it sound like bad for them because, you know, they're also people. And I think but that's the other side of it is building up those contacts with our technology suppliers um, over a long period of time. So you've got those levers to work with them um, and that when things come up and you have ideas, you can work with them and you can say, have you thought about doing this? And, and it's about, again, it's it's bringing them to the table, having them as one of the other stakeholders. Um, they've got their vested interest, they've got their bottom line, but they're also, they are also people who want to help the hearing loss community because that's why they did make hearing aids. Great, um, thanks. Another question we have um, is, um, is there anything we can do in, um, to to educate um, in, the, in, in the educational space to cultivate an appetite for change and curi curiosity to enable greater interest in implementation of new tech or new new services. I, I mean, and I think that would apply both to clinicians and 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 use and patients. Um, and let's not worry about healthcare systems right now about that. <laughs> uh, did did Devet, you said you had you have something? 
Oh no. Um, I didn't necessarily add something now, um, Jill, but but uh, so I just need to, I'm trying to read the question here. So what can we do in the educational space to cultivate an appetite appetite for change and curiosity to yeah. enable greater interest in implementation of new tech resources and services? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I think that's a big, a big question. And, and there's probably um, a lot of different answers to that. I mean, I think I think COVID is one of those things is that has actually cultivated an appetite for change just because out of necessity when people are doing what they've always been doing for years and years you know there's very little curiosity to change and if that model keeps working and you know sustaining them but but COVID has certainly kind of thrown things around when there's disruption people tend to want to find new solutions and they're more open to new solutions so I think I think COVID-19 and other disruptors are a way to kind of instigate this. And then of course, I mean, I, I think it should be instilled if, if we think of education um, in audiology, I think one of, the, one of the values that we should be instilling in new graduates is that the world is changing faster every year. And as audiologists, we need to be quick adapters and we need to be aware of the trends and we do need to make sure that we're not reactive, but we're actually proactively changing so that we can you know adjust to the world around us and provide a, a service that's you know accountable and sustainable and and, and and that can make an impact yeah i yeah. i wonder um i think about the paper that um rob eichen eichenbloom um from australia wrote a few years ago um a surveying audiologist um perception on telehealth and and i wonder if he, they redid that study right now that the, the you know, because, and, and basically showed that a, a number of people were interested and excited about it. A number of people were hesitant and not so interested and, and somewhat skeptical of it. So I wonder right now that I think the results would look quite different. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. So just, um, um, can, I'm, if anybody has any thoughts on it, more specifically how COVID has changed implementation of your services and, and, and do you think that this change is going to continue to, 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 if, if things are going to go back to the way they were, or they're going to continue on this path forward. Um, Adam, do you have any thoughts about that at, at the NHS? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of talk about hybrid models, and I think that what we really need to be thinking about is what meets the needs of each individual patient and having options in our toolbox for them, um, whether it's uh, doing as much remotely as possible, doing more face to face um, and so on. I think it's, it's meeting it comes back to meeting the needs of our patient, but with extra resources that we have on offer. Um, as the needs of the population changes, we can help meet those better. And I think that everyone has talked about how COVID has made us all change. And it's fairly blindingly obvious, but it is about how we sustain the best of that and how we keep the best of that um, for the future is, is, is the challenge. I don't have the answer, but I know what I'd like to do. Um, uh, Chad, do, do you have any comments on that? I, I do. I, I think, you know, for at least the VA, it really has been keeping, you know, the patient at the center of that. So different modalities, different technologies, different use cases. Um, and being, you know, that whole idea of being adaptable, as uh, Dwight, had, you know, had mentioned, and being able to really kind of blend the right care with the, for the right patient at the right time um, is is really a, a critical piece to that. And, you know, I, I know within our portfolio, we continually try to expand that. So for different clinical staff, uh, specialty areas, uh, different patient needs, geographically as well, that really the technology and the service delivery models match really what the patient needs are, so. Thanks. Um, um, Tina, do you want to wrap it up for us? And sure, yeah. closing thought on this. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's relevant. I think this is kind of relevant to what um, Chad and Adam were just saying, and as well as what your question was, that when we think about making making things work in the real world, um, everything happens in a context. 
And some contexts are more rigid than others, right? So like there's this idea of flexibility and it's not just um, the innovation or the innervation, intervention that needs to be flexible or adaptable. It's also the context and, and how much each needs to flex sort of depends on both, right? So like if you are in, I, I feel that um, what, what was talking about was task shifting, like having in some places, the context is so, so flexible and the resources so few that you have to completely shift how you're delivering an intervention to make it work. So that intervention needs to be flexible enough to be delivered by people who might not have been doing it originally at all, which is a huge flex. But in some places, your context may be able to shift a little bit to make a specific intervention work that isn't as flexible. But I think the key is really this multi-level stakeholder buy-in um, and cooperation from people at all different levels, from the patient up to payers, um, to really successfully implement um, all of the great stuff that we know could potentially work and really have public health impact. Great. Well, um, that was just, thank you so much to the panel and to Tina, our keynote. This was so interesting. Um, so we'll have a break now and um, we're supposed to start back up at um, 1230 um, New York time, Eastern time. So, um, thank you so much and, um, we'll see you soon. We'll see you in about 9 minutes. <laughs> thank, thank you everybody. Great panel. We will make everybody now an attendee. You're welcome to stay and listen to the rest of the talk. Of course. Okay. Thank you. Hope you will. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Let me hold on. Thank you for joining us for part two of day four, the final day of the internet and audiology meeting. This panel uh, will discuss hot topics and current events in internet and audiology and the future for remote care. So there's a lot to discuss and it's a broad topic. So please write your questions in the chat so we can, um, you can help drive the focus of this conversation. I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to comment on their backgrounds. We have Fangang Zhang from the University of California, Irvine. We have Christy Miller, who's a research scientist at Facebook. We have Shay Morgan from the University of Louisville. And we have Jackie Clark from the University of Texas at Dallas. So one at a time, could each of you please introduce yourselves by telling us kind of what in your background is relevant to this topic, and could you also comment on maybe one area of innovation in remote hearing care that helped improve access, and um, or you could comment on kind of your vision for the future of hearing care. And if you can manage to do all of that in kind of three to five minutes, then we'll have time to take questions from the chat. So let's go to Shay. Could you start us off, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm Shay Morgan. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the University of Louisville. And my background is coming at this from an educational stance of how do we train future clinicians to uh, be prepared to work in the field, uh, especially when circumstances, unforeseen circumstances might take them out of the clinic. So uh, I've developed an online simulation technology for uh, training audiology, audiology students. And I'm really interested in um, how we can use simulation tools to train clinicians in appropriate techniques so that when they do see patients in person or remotely, they can um, use this, transfer those skills into, um, into useful clinical skills. Great, thank you. And Fengang. Uh, Fengang Zeng, I'm professor at 
University of California, Irvine. I was trained as electric engineer and got interested in psychoacoustics and speech perception. And now I'm working with uh, people uh, with the cochlear implants and the uh, tinnitus. Um, I think the technology you know, is going to play, if not has, you know, a very significant role uh, in, in the way we take care of the audiology business. Great, thank you. And Jackie? Thank you for inviting me. I feel like I'm the weak peg here. I'm just very honored to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I actually am a clinical professor at UT Dallas and I am um, a research scholar with the University of Vatersman in South Africa. So that is really where my introduction many, many, many years ago into the teleaudiology uh, realm started was from South Africa. My interests really have to do with research validation uh, also educational with training our, our up and coming audiologists. Legislative is really critical and we talk about our scope of practice and I've been uh, engaged with that as well on a state level in Texas because a lot of audiologists have been rejecting and trying to uh, totally push back on doing teleaudiology. They don't want it in the states. Uh, and then, of course, the experience um, is, is incredible uh, of what we can do and it's exciting and I always say thanks to COVID, it's pushed us to where we should have been 20 years ago. Uh, and so there's so much opportunity there. Great, thank you. And Christy. Hi, yeah, I'm also very honored to be here. Thank you. Um, I've spent most of my career with one leg in the clinical world and one leg in the research world, um, like many people here, um, anywhere from medical to academic to industrial settings. Um, for most of my career, um, I was at the University of Washington where I completed my PhD under some fantastic mentorship and learned about aging and temporal fine structure and hearing aid processing. Um, and I stayed on as faculty and I taught um, didactic and clinical courses to audiology students um, for nearly eight years. And then um, I was also directing a lab with a research focused on improving hearing aid fittings and trying to identify new variables associated with the variability and outcomes. And so for about at just over a year now, I've been at Facebook Reality Labs where I'm the research lead for hearing sciences. And um, FRL believes that um, AR and VR are gonna help billions of people worldwide um, meet, play games, work, um, you know, anyone, anywhere in the world, even in noisy environments. So the audio team is a very small part of a much larger mission to develop augmented reality or AR into the next computing platform. And so the audio team, we have two goals. One is to make virtual sounds indistinguishable from real sounds. And the second is to make advanced technology um, so that we can hear better in noisy environments. So things like um, advanced beamforming, using AI approaches to noise reduction and intent prediction. Um, so, you know, I get to work with amazing scientists on using um, this AR platform and developing this AR platform for enhancing hearing um, as a supplement to the hearing aid or even potentially a cochlear implant. And so to answer that question that you asked about the most significant development in the area of remote hearing care, you know, that's a hard question to answer because Facebook is not interested at all in remote hearing care. Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here, but you can envision the role that smartphones or computers have played in remote hearing care. And, you know, if, if Facebook's mission is to replace those platforms with an AR platform, then the potential of what you could do with that tool is, you know, wide open and really only limited by your imagination. Great. Thank you. I think we'll get back to a discussion on. Um, AR and VR a little bit later, and I encourage everyone to put your questions in the chat for our panelists. One question is related to um, clinical stimulation. Shay, could you just give us a, a basic overview of what that is and tell us how um, kind of what what is the future of clinical simulation for audiology? How does it help our students and um, kind of where is it now and and where is it headed? Yeah, sure. 
So I think uh, COVID really put a lot of the AED programs on edge a little bit. Suddenly they had students who needed clinical hours, who couldn't get clinical hours as in-person appointments were halted. And we've learned over the past few days that there were great tools in place for um, providing telehealth visits and remote audiology care. Um, but there is this uh, need to continue to develop in, in the students the basic skills of audiometry that um, they weren't getting that experience since hands-on appointments were gone. And so uh, existing simulation tools uh, were largely PC-based. Um, they're kind of spotty on different um, platforms. You, you should have to download. Some of them are very, very expensive. And so I, I envision the future of the, the current state of it now is there are emerging online tools for clinical simulation. Some of these have been around for a couple of years but are not well supported and then suddenly got inundated with uh, requests for use when everything went virtual and online. And uh, so now there are um, good online simulators to help students learn. Um, some of them are inexpensive and uh, students can practice simulating different hearing losses and testing those hearing losses and uh, doing even full cases. Um, so uh, some programs offered are now simulated otoscopy, simulated admittance testing, um, case histories and report writing and uh, automated scoring features. And I think that's really where this will go in the future is helping our students um, gain experience and skills, especially for hard situations before they're put in those hard situations. I think there's a lot of um, anxiety around students getting into an appointment that they don't know how to handle, but the patient's right there with them and their supervisor's reading over, this, over their shoulder. And with an online simulation tool, we can prepare the students for those difficult circumstances and give them tools to practice before they're actually in that scenario to help them uh, feel more confident and feel more prepared and feel more professional and uh, to develop and maintain the rapport with the patient by having already gone through and experienced these really complicated cases. And uh, to do those kinds of simulations, you have to develop simulation tools that will support really complicated cases. And so uh, things like simulating the masking dilemma, not all simulators appropriately uh, model that. And uh, other clinical skills in certain cases, you have to have a robust enough platform that can um, convincingly simulate these types of in-person scenarios. And uh, so I think that's where it's headed in the future, even to the point of integrating with augmented reality or virtual reality to give the experience of grabbing a patient and walking them back into the booth and then entering a simulated test mode and um, debriefing with your supervisor uh, remotely, but in person, synchronously online. Thank you. That's really exciting to think about. Um, does anyone else have a comment on that before I take another question? I have to say, gonna... um, it's interesting. We, we have, you know, we have to balance two things when we're doing simulations and I know that one of the basic skills that are really important for our students are human interaction and asking the hard questions, which you don't get with the simulation necessarily. I mean, they can have a patient acting really strange uh, and you have someone coming in saying that they've been, you know, meth addict and they do this and they do that. And, and a student that comes from a very protected background, it's difficult for them to get that. Uh, so I can definitely see that there's, there's a big marriage that would happen. Um, and the other part that comes into play is not only interacting with the patient, interacting with colleagues, interacting with other professionals. And, you know, as I always tell my students, children come with parents and having to interact with a parent that isn't quite as nice as a child or vice versa. So, you know, we, we do, we're called to, to push ourselves forward and stop worrying about these threats that we seem to think that Someone's going to take over, the AI is going to take over, or the simulations are going to take over what we need to do, uh, but that will never happen. We, we just got to push ourselves further like radiology has done. Yeah, I'll just add to that real quick that yeah, I, I completely agree that simulation is to develop the 
competence and confidence to do the test so that the student then can focus on the more nuanced aspects of their education, which is handling these complicated patient interactions. Um, so improving the skill of the maybe more automatic um, processes that they need to develop can then help them focus more of their time and energy on these complicated social factors that are more difficult for the, the student to master. I was just going to comment that I was I was glad to hear you mention AR and VR because I've heard some um, you know stories about people using VR for training, such as even in ERs for diagnosing people. You know why why is there chest pain and um, you know maybe that could be advanced to a much greater degree to to simulate some of these interactions that we have in our clinics. There's a follow up question from the chat, which is from Terry. And they're asking, how does a student that is not offered these tools that are already vetted by a professor know which are good and bad? Um, speaking specifically so of the simulation tools. I think they are speaking about which of the simulation tools are um, yeah, helpful this is, or not helpful. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. I, I think most of the simulation programs that I can think of are um, smaller companies or personal projects, uh, single single owner LLCs. And um, I found many of the individuals, you know, myself included, really, really responsive to emails from the students so they can ask and, uh, you know, we're in this, or at least I'm, I'm in this for an educational aspect and I'm happy to provide a, a review of the positives and negatives of all the different kinds. So the student can do some research online um, by themselves. Most programs have uh, demo videos or uh, an online user manual that they can read through and kind of check or ask a, ask a colleague. Um, if it's a student, ask a professor if they've even heard of it and that would that can be a good um, a good metric for them to use. But I will say that that is limiting for newer technologies um, that are just emerging that may also have advantages over the more established uh, other technologies. So I think a student can do a little bit of homework, reach out to the companies and um, try and kind of weigh the different comparisons that way. It's a good point and a good question. Um, how how does one know whether they're a student or anyone? How do they know whether we can trust in, in a new system? This question is directed at Christy. Um, how having worked at US CDC, I know Facebook social media data is available for researchers. This person is interested in doing a social media exploration on a specific population. So the question is, is your data categorized so we can access data according to a population and topic? So a very specific question related to maybe interest in a future research. Yeah, I actually, I have no idea. I don't use Facebook data for my research, so I'd have to direct you to find out who to direct you to. So we can connect offline. Okay, maybe we can connect you with them after. Or may, may okay. I comment on that question? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, big data is are necessary right, for producing quality research and clinical practice. Um, when it comes to medical application. You know, there's a huge issue, which is privacy, right? and how do we handle that? I don't think uh, you know, uh, none of us, including the big companies uh, right now, uh, uh, really know. Uh, we're trying to figure that out and to reach a balance where we can get a high quality big data on one hand and wow, protect the privacy. You know, there's a health medical related private information uh, on the other hand. Uh, I think, uh, you know, if we're going to push for remote um, audiological service and that privacy is a huge issue and uh, how do we handle that? And we're not alone. It's a great point. Yep. The next question um, can be answered by anyone, I think, with regards to AR and VR, 
what is the panel's thoughts on the use of gamifying um, treatment and education to patients and students? Eric, the um, question is related to vestibular position testing and rehab in particular, but I think it can be answered in um, a number of different ways. Maybe Christy wants to take this one. I'm just thinking here. Um, gamifying treatment and education. Um, yeah, I think again, I mean, the AR VR platforms are just only limited again by your imagination. There's so much you can do with them. Um, I certainly think there's room for gamifying. Um, you know, I've, I've largely thought about research and using these tools for research. So I can imagine for treatment and education, there's also room for that. Um, you know, I, I can't think of any, I'm trying to think of specific examples for you, but yeah, it's certainly possible. Uh, Christy, may I add an anecdote? Yeah. <laughs> Facebook uh, bought uh, Oculus, uh, which uh, was a company uh, based in Irvine, not far away from <laughs> my lab. Mm -hmm. And earlier days, Oculus actually produced a lot of customers for us uh, because uh, uh, the imbalance or the, the signal processing between uh, the visual and auditory and other image uh, are not perfect matched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of game guys wearing this uh, Oculus uh, AR or uh, VR uh, goggle, uh, goggles, uh, they complain about a dizziness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've played for an hour <laughs> and it caused all sort of vestibular uh, balance problems. So uh, I, I think they have solved the problem to a large extent. Um, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think it's a great research tool right, uh, to help us uh, to <laughs> identify, diagnose, uh, a different kind of uh, disorders, uh, especially uh, in vestibular uh, related issues. And to me, I think this is a very underdeveloped areas. And mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping, you know, people, um, audiologists and scientists, you know, they're getting into that realm. And it's very expensive, you know, to purchase that huge um, a chair rotation, 3D upside down. But hey, AR or VR uh, maybe do a decent uh, job at a very cheap, but also efficient way. One, one thing I'd like to add to this is the uh, offsetting the ease and um, comfort of using a gamified approach to vestibular treatment with the consequences of not playing the game well. And I think especially in vestibular testing, you could imagine that if someone isn't doing the game the right way, or if they're getting uh, low points, because they're not doing, they're not playing the game the right way during a treatment, you might have secondary complications like a canal conversion that would actually exacerbate the issue or make it harder to treat. And so I, I think we have to also be careful not to just jump on the gamify bandwagon for all things, but to weigh the, the potential benefits of, oh, sure, you can use this to diagnose, but you know, when, when you lay someone back for a Dix Hall Pike, if they get a really strong burst of dizziness, and some in some cases that will throw the patient to the ground, do we want our patients connected to an Oculus headset, inducing a vertigo response that will then drop them to the ground, um, especially with vision denied? I, I think so. You know, there are. I think there is room for this, but we do need to be uh, careful uh, that we don't um, unsupervised induce these certain reactions for, for patients. So there, there is a kind of interplay of needing a physical person there for some vestibular tests to just monitor the patient body response to the test itself. Yeah, perhaps a better place to start with um, using AR, VR, and treatment and education might be more in other areas of audiology and not vestibular off the bat, you know, you can think about using them for oral rehabilitation or, um, you know, diagnostics like we talked about earlier, clinical simulations. We have another question that's um, similar from Gabby. Does the panel know about using VR or AR to simulate feelings of social reality beyond that of a face-to-face -face interaction? Um, for example, feelings that the virtual person is really there as an individual. Any thoughts? 
I mean, that's certainly one of the goals is to try to recreate that realistic environment in the virtual environment. And I, you know, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I don't know how many of you have done VR, but it's it's a very immersive experience, but it's not quite reality. So we still have a ways to go, I think. And in my earlier comments, uh, I put on the chat room, right? Um, natural language processing has advanced so much that when you talk to a virtual person, uh, for example, replica, uh, all right, uh, it's hard to tell, you know, you're, are you talking to a real person or are you talking to a virtual person? And they're so smart and, uh, you know, the questions that you ask, the response you get, or and the, the dynamic interchange uh, sometimes make it indistinguishable uh, between a real and a virtual person. So, yeah, I think social interactions, that's next and they're coming. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add in education, that's one of the challenges is simulating the patient variability in an appropriate way. Those of you who have used audiology simulators know that all of them offer some sort of variability so that the uh, patient, virtual patient, isn't always responding at threshold perfectly, but that there's some variation in their response characteristics and um, getting that response to feel like a real appointment is is tricky. and then adding in things like I'm done with this appointment, uh, having a, a patient just say, just straight up drop the appointment, which sometimes happens in clinic, um, programming that to happen while, um, while also allowing the student to complete testing every time is a, it's a real trick. But um, I, I do think that at some point we'll be able to have these interactions where we, we feel like there actually is a patient in the booth uh, because their variability is consistent enough with population-based norms um, that the responses are are normalized and seem seem realistic. I, I know Lauren Calandrucio, who did a presentation here on their audiometer simulator, they were pulling cases and data from the NHANES database so that the, the simulations you were doing were realistic hearing profiles. I'm doing the same thing in my simulator to try and model any random audiogram you might generate is pulled from a distribution of potential audios that comes from a real life database so the you know you might do 10 simulated cases and the proportion of sloping hearing losses versus flat versus conductive should be uh, reflective and that's one of the ways we're trying to make some things reality but then simulating the social aspect of it is is completely a different uh, a different part but i think it's coming um, separately, I study social emotion and um, getting people to induce an emotional response is also a tricky thing to study because of um, potential uh, human ethics issues of forcing or, or trying to manipulate the social or emotional state of an individual has certain ethical considerations that must come along with it. And so I, I think that it would take a broad effort and a, a very careful oversight to do studies that would yield social um, manipulations in a virtual setting. Thanks, Shay. And I would point any um, attendees to the presentation tab on the conference website if you want to see Shay or Lauren's presentation, which includes a demonstration of the, um, the interactive uh, simulations that they're talking about, that Shay mentioned. We have a couple of other questions that are along the same line. Brianna asks, do you think VR could be utilized for group AR to make it more accessible for people? And what do you think that would look like? And I'm gonna combine that with another question. Um, which is directed at Christy, but I think any of us can, any of you can answer it. So, um, what would, could VR be used for group AR? Could VR be used for group AR and what would it look like? And then how could, um, how is VR being used to make, um, make it look real, make, um, make VR look more realistic? Um, okay, so the first question using a uh, using VR for group rehab, I think that could uh, certainly be done. Um, 
you know, in some ways it's maybe not as accessible for people because they have to have a VR headset. Um, and um, so, and there's, there's nuances in group AR that you're, you're that right now can't be simulated, I think, in VR, going back to that social discussion we just had. Um, and so uh, it would take a bit of work, but I think it's certainly doable. Um, you know, I guess I could envision, even in the gaming industry, it seems like, like if you ever look at what games are available in VR, you know, they're all, they're, none of them are very social right now. I think that we have a long way to go in that social aspect. And so, um, but I can imagine that you could create environments that have, um, you know, whatever scene you want to practice in your AR group and everybody could go to that scene and practice their, um, you know, being assertive and, um, you know, maybe manipulating the environment or, or other cues that you want to teach them, other skills. Um, you know, you could create whatever scene you you want to create and put people in it. Um, so I don't know, you know, that again, that's just only limited by your imagination, but I think we're still in general working on making um, making good social um, scenes um, in VR. I don't think we've gotten there yet. Um, and then the second question, how are you trying to make it real in VR and what's the goal in making it real? I think, was that the one, Laura? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, for the audio team, that has to, a lot to do with um, spatialization of sound, head-related transfer functions, you know, making people sound like they're not all coming through the telephone, you know, or the computer screen from the same speaker, making people sound like they're actually in real space. Um, so that's a big one. Um, for the audio team, there's a lot of, um, you know, optics that go into it as well that um, is part of the, the broader team's goals. So, um, you know, but as somebody mentioned earlier, those avatars are looking pretty real um, in some situations, but I think there's room to go in both the visual and the auditory areas to make to make those more real. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you see a role for voice technologies like Alexa, Siri, Google in assessment, for example, speech recognition, comprehension, counseling, troubleshooting um, of devices? Any of you can jump in, I think, on this one. Maybe I'll start. And uh, I think a counseling, yes. Um, it's it's a very natural way yeah, to to have a one on one kind of a talk, and you can do it in that session. And I think with the AR VR, you know, you can do a group session. Uh, the harder part is to the first one, uh, uh, Siri or, or other uh, automatic speech platform to assess a speech recognition. Um, whether you know the calibration is an issue, standardization of uh, test materials would be another. So until we have some kind of agreement and we can control the, the environment and the data that you get from this uh, home-based platform may not be uh, as reliable. And there's better ways uh, to do that. And I think uh, uh, in the event of time, we can talk about it. All right, I'll stop here. I, Same I think I'm feeling mm -hmm. slightly conflicted in some ways because Educationally, we want to we want to provide a, a great environment that will mimic the clinic. And when we look at the A A R and V R, um, and then the other conflict I have though is, is that we have technology that why do I need to be running an audiometer? Um, and you know so. Really, what is it that I want to accomplish at the end of the day? Educationally, yes, of course, I want people educated. But when I talk about the end game, my end game is trying to provide the best quality care I can for the patient and still oversee what's happening clinically. Uh, and so it, it, do we, are we looking at potentially training, um, an assistant, an audiology assistant to do the pure tones. And then the next part of it is uh, the counseling, as uh, you, you said, is so very important. And the counseling is difficult on AR and VR because every person is so unique and you have to 
identify really what are they what are they saying they don't want? They're, are they saying because they're fearful of change, or they've had a bad experience with something else? Stressful, um, and how can you put that into AR and, and VR? But, I mean, my conflict is, is that. I feel that audiology in general, we need to stop protecting the low end of our scope. We need to let go and let someone do the testing and someone do the admittance um, and let us do the integration of information, uh, which that's a lot of that is, is human integrating the information, bringing in the human aspects. Uh, so, you know, then it, then how are we going to handle this educationally wise? I, I, I get the need. Uh, but once we, we move forward, we really need to step away and let an assistant handle the stuff, you know, that the radiology assistants type what they're doing. So it's, it's this conflict that's always going on of what's our end game? Well, wow, Jackie, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I, the future audiologists, those who will survive, will be information integrator. I think that's the key, you know, we're going to integrate information from patients from our other, you know, primary physicians, you know, from uh, all this automatically generated collective information and the judgment you know, is in the, in the, in the brain, the knowledge uh, based. I mean, that's a, you know, why we, tr we need a training and sharing, talk about, I mean, and you try to simulate it so you can gain those kind of knowledge that will help you make the right judgment best for your customers and those who, who can do that will survive. I just also want to completely agree with that. I mean, if I can, in the course of a year, create a program that follows a series of rules that allows you to simulate a hearing test, it's just the rocks throw away from being able to have a computer follow those exact same rules and perform a, an equally valid and efficacious test. And some of the posters at this conference illustrated that we're, we are really good at pure tone estimation, even remotely. So um, I, I echo that. I don't think that the future of our field is in the diagnostic testing. We don't get reimbursed well for it anyway, so <laughs> no one should feel sad about it. Um, but we can either push for better reimbursement or um, adapt and evolve. And I think that utilizing audiology assistants and then having them train using these remote tools and programs, maybe creating a, a centralized certificate program for audiology assistants that integrates the use of training tools um, would be beneficial to make sure that they are fo all following the same rules so that if you get an assistant from anywhere in the country or world, you know that they have had some level of, of consistent training and then you can focus more on the integration of knowledge, the social aspect of interacting and building rapport with the patient and coming to a diagnosis that will benefit their hearing health. Those are excellent points. Um, I, so you mentioned, Shay, the future of audiology, and that's, of course, the topic, one of the topics that we're talking about today. Yesterday in the industry panel, there was some discussion of um, over-the-counter devices and self-fitting hearing aids. There's a question about um, OTC devices, self-fitting hearing aids, also AirPods and hearables. Can the panel comment on their view, um, your view on those devices and the role that they have in the future of audiology? It's funny, I, I've had two patients now back to back um, that have the little amplifier and they they're not appropriate for their hearing loss. Uh, but having said that, some of the OTCs are fine for the mild hearing loss because we don't see those patients anyway. Um, I, I rarely see someone with a mild hearing loss. It's just when they get into, you know, as they, their hearing loss continues and they're going, this isn't working now, I know why. But it's in many ways, I think the, the over the counter is is a good introduction in, into some amplification and what they're missing out on. Uh, and also the value of audiology to fit it correctly. And the two patients most recently that um, back to back that were saying, yeah, I got this and it 
does okay, but I know I'm missing. Um, so I, I think they're a great entry point. I, I have no no qualms with the OTCs. And as remember, it's a consumer product. They have a shorter life expectancy than our medical durable devices. So again, that's a win for us. Yeah, I'll just throw my two cents in too that um, in trying to simulate a, an appropriate, the appropriate audiogram for the population, it some data say that yeah, up to 80% of people with hearing loss have mild to moderate. But I would say that probably 80% of the people that we see in clinic have moderately severe or worse. <laughs> and so if these devices are, are regulated or beneficial to the um, majority of the population who aren't seeking hearing health care, then let them, I, I have no problems with them getting a, an introduction to hearing technology sooner. And then as their hearing progresses and um, continues to decline, realizing the limitations of their existing technology and then seeking out additional health services later. So I just thought that was an interesting flip is my, my program was generating all these mild and moderate hearing losses because that's what the data show but in our actual clinics that those students will be seeing you have to shift some of those percentages to be representative of the sample of the population that actually seeks hearing health care which is very different than the actual population statistics anyone else or yeah I'll, I'll comment on that um, the OTC, whether well, it's it's not a if I mean when will they come? You know, we've been waiting for FDA's decision since last August. Nothing has happened, um, and they recently issued a warning against a few companies that claim they have a uh, OTC hearing aids. Um, I, I think uh, this is uh, uh, backward. Yeah, I mean, it's a uh, whether FDA will do something or not. I think the truth is, who cares? I'll just give you the example of Apple, right? And uh, Laura mentioned AirPods, right? And I have a mild hearing loss. Guess what? <laughs> this is my AirPods. Seamless connected. You know, if I have a trouble listening to you guys or uh, air conditioning on or the, the, wind, uh, the leaf blowers doing something, I put this on. And, uh, you know, it's a great. And guess how much it costs? 250 right? The high end, uh, 499 um, I'll give you one number, say why this is uh, irresistible as coming. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the total revenue, revenue, total revenue for all five hearing aid companies and four or five cochlear implant companies, the revenue is $12 billion. One, two, $12 billion. Apple, one product, Air, AirPods, last year they sold $60 million. 250, that's $15 billion. One product from one company is a similar, slightly higher than the total revenue of hearing aid and cochlear implant worldwide combined, right? And how do hearing aid or cochlear implant companies compete against these guys? I know Facebook and Christie say, or when will your product be introduced? <laughs> not, not a big one, small one, you know, earbud, I know that's where you're going, and Google is going, Google is also developing their own version of the earbud, right? So with Samsung, of course, another big player in this uh, 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 area. Um, I agree with what Jackie and Shay said, and I think 90% uh, of those, they have a mild hearing loss, right? and they're not gonna see you, me, <laughs> or Laura, Right, I think uh, this is the solution. Whether we call it consumer electronics, uh, hearables, OTC, I really don't think we care that much. I certainly don't care. I'm using it to help me. Uh, and I think the other side effect, the good side effect of uh, these hearables, right, is to help us reduce the social stigma associated with wearing hearing aids. Right, if everybody's doing that, you know, the cool people are doing that. Well, why not? hearing impaired people with hearing loss uh, wear the same thing, right? I think I mean, that's a good thing. Thank you, those are great points. 
We have a question from the chat that's for Jackie. It's from a clinician who is talking about evidence-based practice and validation data that oftentimes comes from a manufacturer. She says, um, they say as a clinician, they would be critical of manufacturer generated validation data, um, even if it's collected to a quote gold standard. So how would you recommend navigating this conflict of interest for future validation efforts? So kind of switching topics here, but asking you for your experience as a clinician, how do we um, navigate kind of these innovative tools being on the market and being um, that the evidence base kind of lags years behind and um, it, how do we increase clinical uptake of those tools? Uh, it, it is it is a very tricky path to try to navigate around. Um, if you don't mind me telling you a very brief brief story about the importance sometimes of having the industry being involved in the research. Um, and so it's it's all about um, the the poor bunny rabbits and um, you know what twenty five years ago or thirty years ago there was this big concern about cholesterol being so high and you need to stop eating eggs that they're they're horrible for you and they're going to raise your cholesterol levels and everybody stop eating eggs which the egg manufacturers were all up in arms about um, and then they the manufacturers are saying we can do the research let us do the research and no one would look at the industry's research they just said well it's the industry so therefore it's not any good uh, and someone outside finally did the research and discovered you know what they're feeding bunnies the eggs and the bunnies cholesterol why high well bunnies don't eat eggs it causes them to raise cholesterol it's not made that's not their digestive system it's bad for them um, and so the pre people that did the research were you know not part of the the vendors and they came up with bad data and it actually was catastrophic for a number of years for the egg producers um, so I think that we get way off base when we start saying whatever comes out of the industry is wrong and you know what's happening. It is important that everything is transparent. If there's a conflict of interest, you mitigate the conflict of interest by being very transparent. And it's very clear that, by the way, this research was paid for by blah, blah, blah. But we also know over time, as we all kind of jump on the bandwagon, well, what about we turn it this way and try this research? And let's try it during that way. And eventually you're gonna start seeing if it's valid, it'll hold and it'll hold steady. Um, and you know, I, I'm absolutely not the first to, to embrace blindly what someone says. So manufacturers are gonna say, hey, these hearing aids are gonna reduce all the noise, they're gonna do this for you, and they're gonna make you fly, and they're gonna do this. So I, I, I'm not going to jump in and embrace that. I'm, I'm a very skeptical person, but that also means I'm not going to reject what they're doing. I'm going to start investigating. And what I love about being in the clinic is it's like, well, let's see what they really do. And, um, and, and that's, what, that's what we're educated to do. Let's see what they really do. Uh, so I, I can say I don't really have qualms about someone doing research for the industry as long as you're transparent. And we need the we need the industry. We need the research. So, I, I hope that that answers the question. Thank you, Jackie. Anyone else have a comment on that before I move to the next question? I'll add a quick uh, comment. Uh, I agree. Evidence based. Research is needed and it's very important, right? That's how you gain your peers' recognition, approval. I mean, I look at uh, um, the reimbursement Shane mentioned, right? To a large extent, that why hearing aids are not reimbursed by Medicare and uh, many or most insurance companies, right? And even hearing tests. Right. Okay. I and mean, that's a, we have to look at ourselves. <laughs> what evidence have we generated right, to justify that reimbursement? Right. I, th I think, uh, you know, that's, a, that's something that I think uh, we as a field, you know, we got to do solve that problem instead of pointing fingers. Oh, we should get reimbursed for our work. Well, produce evidence to justify that. 
I, I agree with that. I, I was going to take an educational stance on this and encouraging everybody to be as critical. I think the original question said that you're working for a small startup and now you're trying to convince people to look at your validation data, but you yourself are always critical of others' validation data because of how you want to spin it. And I definitely uh, understand that. And we teach our students in our program to uh, you know, a whole section of one of my courses is dedicated to trying to critically assess research to um, find the story that they're trying to tell and maybe another story that the data are actually showing. And yeah, everybody wants to spin their data in the way that they want to, um, but we, we do need to be critical and it starts with educating our students to be critical uh, scientists and to look for rigorous methods. But then I agree uh, that we need to, as a field, also use the, the principles we've learned today of implementation science to implement tools that are more effective. I mean, we've known for years that pure tone thresholds are not really great predictors of um, anything except the audibility of a pure tone. <laughs> and so we've known this for years, but we, um, we still hold on to certain tests that are um, deprecated or non-contributional non to a diagnosis, but we still do them. And um, I agree that we can't expect to better reimbursement while we're using outdated or ineffective or non-evidence-based tools. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I'll pop in on one last point though, is that, you know, when the PCAST met um, and the, they were looking at, well, what's the evidence? What, how do you know hearing aids really work for people? Where is it? Um, and we have anecdotal, maybe 20 people, maybe 50, maybe for lucky 100 people. That is not population based. Shame on us. We have been going decades without getting population based data. And we, we need to do that. And, you know, it, it's shameful that we have ignored it. Uh, it's time for us to get moving and get the population based data. Because can you really tell me population based wise that hearing aids are effective? I can tell you anecdotally. I know by, you know, by a population. So shame on us. We need to get with it. And probably the only profession that seems to be sitting on our backside, you know, saying, I need to get paid. I need to get paid. Well, insurance companies are looking for this evidence based information. They want, they want population is what insurance companies want. We can't produce it. So we need to get on it. Sorry, I get a little hot under the collar about that. I also want to add real quick that. We in, in our individual clinics sometimes don't even look for our own validation. Um, I know it's very common practice among practices to fit a hearing aid, send them out the door, and you don't even bother to retest their speech perception with the hearing aid in. You know, you do word recognition testing at a good and audible level, and then the classic counseling tool is see if you hear it loudly enough, your speech could be this good. And then we put a hearing aid on and we say, good luck, come back in a week and we'll hopefully the acclimatization setting will adjust it. But in reality, we should put the hearing aids on to show them the benefit right there. And if there is none, we can, we can look toward other alternative options or at least spare them the, um, the time and effort of trying these things on with a, with a $3,000 down payment on something that they're hoping to return later uh, because they aren't getting the benefit. So I think individual clinics on top of this population data that Jackie was mentioning, we do need that, but we also need to do a better job at proving that the device is doing what it's doing to the patient. Um, rather than just saying, oh, I think it feels better. And I'll just share one little anecdotal story about that is yeah, I had one of those patients once, I have an AUD as well as my PhD, and I saw a, a, a patient once who was very, very, um, just couldn't be satisfied. And um, I realized that for this patient, it was, it was almost a psychological need to doubt that hearing aids were working. And so, you know, for, for how, what it was worth, he came in one time and it was probably the fourth time I'd seen him. And I just clicked it all the gain up three and clicked it back down three back to the original settings. Oh, thank you so much. It sounds so much better. And, and he was just as happy walking out the door. But there's no reason for me to expect him to have anything different happen because I don't tell him, look, it is actually improving your word recognition. 
and you, you know, this is you before hearing aids, and this is you after hearing aids. Um, so anyway, I'll get off that soapbox now. <laughs> Laura, can I have a, a follow-up to uh, Shane's comment? Um, you're, you're right. Not only do you have to measure speech recognition, I think this is where the future is, right? The, the remote fitting, right? Now, if you look at the number one complaint about hearing aid users or cochlear implant users, right? Listening in noise environment, realistic cocktail party, restaurant, you know, social gatherings, right? So I think with the technology, maybe Facebook, uh, uh, Christie will develop uh, in the future, right? We'll feed the hearing aid live at the restaurant when you talk to your friend, right? This is a more realistic uh, a goal instead of feeding hearing aids in a quiet, soundproof, <laughs> double water booth. That's not the way to do it. That's why people are not happy, satisfied with their hearing aids. Yeah, I actually think well, that's. Um, sorry, I was going to jump in, Laura. One of the other questions in the chat was about you. You know, the potential uses of VR, and you know, I think that creating more realistic environments to do this type of testing um, is one of the primary advantages to using virtual reality. Um, you know, we're in 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 any aspect of audiology, we're trying to simulate the real world to a greater degree when we choose to do it. To Shay's point. Um, and so, yeah, that's one benefit of virtual reality. Yeah. Speaking toward the future, I, I could imagine, you know, when you go get an eye exam, they have this wall of eyeglasses and they say, do you like one or two? Which one's better? And three or four, which one's better? What if you go to a restaurant and you open up your smartphone app and you say situation one or situation two, and you say the one that you that is helping you hear better and you just push it and then it pops up a new two new settings. And so you go to a bar you're with your friends and you do 10 different scenarios and eventually the program would learn your hearing preferences in different scenarios. And then detecting those scenarios could shift your uh, devices into your preference for that. Now, this also runs into evidence-based practice concerns of maybe the patient's preferences aren't um, maximizing the gain. Uh, we had a discussion earlier in a different session on real ear measures and and doing in-ear probe mic measures and things like that. And so there is this comfort. It, it is the patient's preferred audio maximal for their hearing loss. And you know, I go back to the age-old saying of the best hearing aid is the one people will wear. <laughs> and the one that they view is giving them the most benefit. Um, but yeah, we, we should strive for maximal benefit um, by gain standards, but if they won't wear it, then I'd take someone with uh, a slight under amplification that's going to wear the device and feel benefit from it. Um, we just have a couple of minutes. We have three minutes until the close. I'd like to just wrap up by um, getting comments from each of you on what you think. Um, so we've talked about Everyone has talked about today and over the course of the past four days, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shifted things for everyone. And for a lot of clinicians, they've embraced telehealth and new technologies. And there's been some talk over the past few days that after the pandemic, they're gonna go back to face-to-face -to -face, um, and let, let go of these new innovations. Not everyone, but some people. Can any of you, can each of you comment on what are some strategies that we can use? What are some recommendations that you can give to um, embracing, continuing on with these innovations, continuing on with remote care even after the pandemic? Any thoughts that you can give related to that? Let's just jump in. I can say um, clinically, uh, I have enjoyed being able to interact with family over you know the family the patient when we're just virtual and you know they're it's kind of they're going well we don't want to be there either so yeah we'd like to so just the counseling part has been invaluable um and, and i mean that's pre-fit post-fit um getting someone to even start getting off high center and coming in for a hearing test to see if they need a hearing aid 
that's been very invaluable. As far as doing testing, you know, I'm kind of still stuck with having one on one in the sound booth because I am really picky about what I want to get and part of it is speech and noise and I can't I can't clearly succinctly do speech and noise through through anything. Um, but I, I'm hoping that we'll feel like we'll be pushed more and more and trying to, to reach out. And, and I do know that there are a number of ways that you can still reprogram a hearing aid from a distance. My private practice is in a very poor area of Texas. Most of my patients have little clamshell cell phones if they have a, a cell phone at all. And so many of them don't have internet. Um, so it's almost like I'm back in Africa, although Africa has a lot more internet activity than we do in rural Texas. Um, but I think that it, it, it's been a good thing to force us to push us into areas we're uncomfortable with. Christy, do you have any concluding thoughts for us? Uh, I, I feel like there have been some um, innovations in the literature on um, speech and noise testing, for example. I mean, I remember reading a study about somebody using Alexa to score a speech and noise test, and they actually got pretty, you know, reasonable results compared to the lab. Um, so I'm hoping that some of those innovations and some of the, you know, new approaches to remote user studies will will stay around and allow us to get to that population data that we're looking for. I'll just speak again from the education standpoint that I feel like these tools were just unknown before COVID and now that they are becoming more accessible and online rather than a user download that may or may not work on a given computer. I, I've had more people um, saying that they're looking to continue using these tools after rather than only using it during pandemic shutdowns. So I'm optimistic that these tools will be a new tool in the tool belt for instructional use and that will just get the students more and more familiar with telehealth in general and online tools. And um, I hope that it's here to stay. Great, thank you. Pangang, do you have 30 second last thoughts for us? I agree with every panelist, the comment, right? The technology, some of them even was ready, but we don't want to use them. And COVID has accelerated the pace and acceptance, right? I, I think that's, a, a, again, a good thing. So we should uh, embrace uh, uh, this technology, producing evidence-based <laughs> data. Great, I think that um, sums up the theme for our panel today is that we need more data, more evidence, but also that there's a lot of innovation out there that um, is to be embraced. So thank you all so much. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and thanks to everyone for submitting your questions. Um, it really led to an interesting discussion. I'm gonna hand off the mic to our conference chair, Valeri Shafiro, who will lead us in closing remarks because today ends our conference our meeting and um, he's gonna have some important comments about the future of this conference. So thank you all for joining us. If you'll stick around for just a couple of minutes for some comments from Valeri. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we'll bring the uh, wonderful organizing committee, my co-chairs back so they can uh, say a few words as well, if they like. Uh, and uh, for myself, uh, well, we have come to the end of our meeting and over the last four days, we've heard from um, clinicians, we heard from the academic researchers, from industry leaders, and um, we all learned a lot. There were wonderful talks and discussions uh, so some amazing presentations, synchronous presentations. And uh, I think it was uh, Winston Churchill who said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So I think we certainly had a good crisis. I, I don't know how good it is, but uh, it was certainly a big crisis. And um, the interest in teleaudiology has increased dramatically 
uh, even judging by the attention that L audiology gets at different meetings and at uh, registration for this meeting. It still remains to be seen how much of this will stay when things go back, when we can all move around again and meet each other. Uh, probably some things will change and some won't. Uh, we will have to reconvene and see, I guess. Um, we, I think that this meeting uh, made it clear that there is a tremendous potential, that there are many opportunities. Uh, there is still a lot to be learned. There are many questions. We certainly haven't answered all of them, but hopefully we identified some important directions and there is, uh, we will be able to kind of stay the court and, um, and develop this field further. So, um, I think there's just a couple of logistical points that I want to bring before we close. Uh, we will have the gather town open for a bit longer, uh, for probably another week at least. And so people who are welcome to click on the link and explore the presentations, they're still there, or to go up to the meeting and to uh, continue discussions, if you like. Uh, for people who are interested in uh, continuing education credits, we have ASHA CEUs and we have credit for uh, in the Netherlands for audiologists and dispensers. So if you go to the conference website and scroll down at the home tab, you will see forms that you'll need to fill out. Please do that. And please do that before May 14. Um, we will be sending some follow-up emails looking for information and feedback from all those who participating in the meeting, because we would like to plan the future of the meeting. We, know, we would like to know what worked, what didn't work, what you liked about the meeting, what you didn't like about the meeting. This has been a new way of doing things for us, and we certainly learned a lot. But it would be great to have an uh, audience perspective on what worked and what didn't. And also, we will be looking for ideas of how to continue sort of having this discussion with what is the best format for internet and audiology. So please look for uh, your emails uh, for email, for an email from us. And of course, I would like to thank all speakers, panelists, presenters for contributing their work, to contributing to the discussion. This has been wonderful. This is what made the meeting great. Um, and my co-chairs on the organizing committee, Laura, Jill, Gabby, uh, for kind of staying the course and coming up with ideas. I think this wouldn't have happened without if we didn't put our heads together. Um, also, Maria Kipronk and Evelyn Davis Venn, who were involved with the organizing committee at earlier stages, uh, but couldn't uh, stay on for one reason or another. Uh, all of those were good reasons. Um, and uh, Finally, Rush, my home institution that is hosting the meeting. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Bree Coral, who is an audiologist student. I'll turn my uh, computer around so you can see Bree, who's been working on the background and holding all the pieces together, basically in communi coordinating communications, email, scheduling, web events. So this was all her and it's been a great service to this meeting and to the community. Uh, we also have Ava Raynor, who designed uh, all of the Gather Town for our meeting from scratch. And so thank you, Ava. And Emily Price, who was our photographer, who charted with a map of Gather Town, which was also no mean feat. Um, so lastly, uh, the IT, IS group here, Jan Lee, who's our um, web designer, Pedro Luna and Chris Lewis, our software and hardware uh, experts who helped to put it together. And in some ways, having this going virtual, you actually rely on technology even more than when you're all together in one physical space. So this is the work that you don't really see, but it is very important work. So I think this is uh, all that I have, and uh, we'll turn it to the co-chairs if you'd like to add something.
Well, I, I'd like to add a uh, thank you to Valeri for for making this all happen. You know, at previous internet and audiology meetings, we've had a lot of issues with technology for the remote attendees while we were having a face to face meeting. And so I know we were very concerned about that coming to this meeting and I just think you, um, you thanks so much for all of your hard work and pulling all this together. It really worked well. Yeah, I second that. I also thank you for your, for your patience as we threw all these ideas at you. <laughs> I feel like sometimes we went around in circles and then we would come back to the same thing and you'd be like, leave me alone. So <laughs> you handled that really well. So I think it was great. Thank you. And Bree as well, who is, as I said earlier today, has been so kind of cool and calm and pulled it together. It's, it's been really good. So thank you. I think you all covered it. Thank you, Valeria and Bree. And this is my fourth Internet and Audiology meeting. So the other meetings I attended in person. And I think while well, this meeting being virtual, we missed the in-person interaction. I think it has expanded access to folks in different areas that wouldn't have been able to attend if it were in person. So there are benefits to being virtual. And I look forward to seeing what will look like in, in the future. So. Yeah, thank thank you all again. And I think this was just the planning process was really enjoyable. It was challenging in some ways, as it would be expected with any meeting, but I think it was really creative. I think it gave us all an opportunity to see how can we envision this new format and what can we do with it. So I, I really enjoyed it. And again, you know, we'll be looking for feedback from all the participants from the meeting about your ideas. Uh, because you may see something that we don't, and we'd like to consider it as we uh, look into the future. So thank you again, and um, we'll see you another time. The Gather Town is open, by the way, so maybe see you there. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.